Ladies and gentlemen, that special time has arrived, the evening program. We have a special guest uh, among us tonight. He is uh, a guest of Michael and Louise right here front and center. His name is Ryan Rodriguez. And the re and what, what we want you to know is that Ryan is one of the rising stars of birding in Texas and the Rio Grande Valley. He's 14 years old. He lives here in McAllen. Ryan, please stand and let, let everybody see who you are. And Ryan, um, you know, I have been in touch with uh, a couple of the people who uh, organized the Rio Grande Valley Birding Festival this year, and they just raved about him because he served as a guide at the event. And uh, the last thing I want to say, and, you know, no less important than any of the others is that he is going to be in Camp Chiricahua next summer. So, Ryan, welcome, and we're thrilled to have you with us tonight. And with that, that concludes my comments, and I'm going to welcome Victor Emanuel. Thank you. We had another, I think, everyone, another awesome day. <laughs> And the most awesome thing is being with all of you. Yes, we have such a wonderful group. And we had something very special today, the King Ranch trip, with several leaders, added a bird to the King Ranch list, the American Flamingo. <laughs> I don't know. I'll find out from Tom the last time a bird was added to the King Ranch list. It's that's I'm sure a long time ago. So that but anyone had a wonderful day. I'm not going to go over a lot of detail about the day. I know everyone had a wonderful day and it's great to be together. Now I wanted to introduce my friend George Archibald. And it's a huge honor to have him here. He's one of the great conservationists of the world. And I love people that have an idea and make it happen. Uh, I did that with Vent, and we'll I'll talk about how that happened, but George did it in a bigger way with the Crane Foundation, and he was at Cornell with his friend Ron Sowie, and they came up with the idea they knew cranes were in trouble everywhere to have the Crane Foundation, and Ron said, well, you can just use my father's barn in Minnesota, so it just started in a barn. Ron was going to lead our first India trip with Bob Ridgely, but sadly, he had a stroke and died, but George carried on. And the cranes were all in trouble and he's helped so many of them and he's gotten so many awards. He's gotten the, uh, a PhD from, he got his PhD from Cornell and he's gotten the gold medal award from the World Wildlife Fund, a fellows award from the MacArthur Foundation, the Wildlife Conservation Award from the Zoological Society of San Diego, the Lilly Medal from the Indianapolis Zoo, the Douglas Pym Lott Award from Nature Canada, the Order of Canada on behalf of Queen Elizabeth II. And he received the inaugural Dan Lufkin Award for Environmental Leadership from National Audubon Society. And he's got this book, My Life with Cranes. And I first heard about him. Uh, I went to, to Wisconsin because a wonderful woman named Emily Early, who had traveled with us a lot, who had been head of Nature Conserving, invited me to come up to see Wisconsin. And she took me up to meet George and give a talk at the Crane Foundation and see the cranes. And that's when I first met him. But I also heard a lot about him from my friend, Peter Matheson, one of my dearest friends, because Peter made a lot of trips with George to see cranes. Like me and like George, Peter loved cranes. And I heard about him from, from Peter and got to meet him when he came down to see Whooping Cranes project in Louisiana. I'd seen him there in Wisconsin. But one of my stories I'm going to tell, and I got his permission to tell this, it's a great story about ideas that people have that don't necessarily work out. He had the idea of taking Ted Turner, who had done very well in his career financially, starting cable television, to Korea to talk to people about buying the DMZ from North Korea and South Korea, each would get half the money, and making it into an international park. What a brilliant idea. I love people that have brilliant ideas, even though it didn't happen. I mean, they wanted, even for Ted Turner, he can tell you how much money, but it was millions and millions and millions of dollars. But the DMZ now is a wildlife sanctuary because no one can go there because their guns aimed at everything. So <laughs> guns, you cannot go into the DMZ. So you can't plant crops. You can't build a high rise. It's all a 
international park in quotes. But whenever peace breaks out, and who knows when that will be, it'll all be divided and be houses and sky rise, high rises and no room for wildlife and cranes. So I thought it was a brilliant idea and he got Ted Turner to go and it was, it unfortunately didn't work out for now. But he's done so much for cranes and I, it, I, I tremendously admire him for that. And I am tonight uh, going to pledge a significant contribution myself to the Crane Foundation more than I've already given. And I encourage everyone to support the Crane Foundation because cranes everywhere need help. George Archibald, we're honored to have you. Thank you, Victor, for inviting me to speak to this group tonight. I've made so many wonderful friends, <laughs> and uh, I hope that we can keep in touch in the future. It's been very, very special. And tonight, uh, I'll introduce you to our organization. We're almost 50 years old, just a little bit older than Vent. And we're located in the land of Aldo Leopold in central Wisconsin. His shack is just 10 miles down the road, down Shady Lane Road, from the headquarters of the Crane Foundation. And from this 252-acre uh, property, we have programs that go all around the world, including to Louisiana. And that's where I met Victor and Peter Matheson and Bob Bateman <laughs> at, uh, on a trip down to see the reintroduction of the whooping cranes. This is the headquarters refuge hunting lodge for the Amico Corporation, which they sold to BP and BP then sold it to the state of Louisiana. And uh, I go down there every winter uh, through my connection with reintroducing the whooping cranes to Louisiana. And Victor and his staff and these celebrities came down, and this is what we found, this beautiful bird, which we don't have in Wisconsin. And we also found the whooping crane. That's the alarm call of the whooping crane. And the whooping crane's most important area historically in the United States was not so much Texas, but Louisiana. Huge flocks used to come there in the winter, and there was even a non-migratory resident breeding flock in Louisiana. And since 2010, we've been helping to reestablish the non-migratory part. There's Victor back at that beautiful meeting talking to one of the major supporters of the Crane Foundation, Mary Kohler. You may have heard of Kohlers if you've gone to the bathroom enough. <laughs> And they fly our cranes all over the country, complimentary on their jet, because we have a population of about 150 whooping cranes in captivity. And for the genetic management, we're always having to move birds around to pair up. And this is our dear friend, Peter Matheson, who's no longer with us. But I met Peter in 1993 in Russia and he was fascinated by cranes, and I was fascinated by Peter Matheson, especially <laughs> his Snow Leopard book, which was one of my favorites. And uh, I in invited him. I said, why don't you write a big book on cranes of the world, and I'll bring you to see them. And I reasoned, if I can pour everything I know about cranes into Peter, Peter Matheson's head, the product is going to be far superior to anything I could write. So for 10 years, we worked together on that. Bob Bateman also was on that trip. And here, here he is with my role model. Have any of you in this room traveled with, with Sarah Simmons? No? She was from Louisiana. Did you? And uh, actually, I met her through Vent because she joined one of the trips to Russia 
and came to Moraviovka Park, which is the first private nature reserve in Russia that we helped establish in 1994. And she came in 97 and became interested in the Crane Foundation. Subsequently, she signed up for a trip to Bhutan, where I go every year. And uh, within 10 minutes, we had this incredible conversation about the history of the whooping cranes in Louisiana and the loss of the whooping cranes in Louisiana and my interest in reintroducing them back to Louisiana. But I had been speaking to the authorities in Louisiana for decades and always got this big no, we can't bring the whooping cranes here because it would impact hunting. And uh, about this time, there was a new clause in the Endangered Species Act called experimental non-essential, so we could do reintroduction programs without stopping the hunting. So Sarah had that information and she returned to Louisiana and phoned up the government people and said, you've got to reintroduce the whooping cranes and so on. Well, here's Bob Bateman and he and Peter worked together on this book. And there are 45 original Bateman paintings in this book. And it's called The Birds of Heaven. And I highly recommend it if you want to hear about crane stories from far and wide. And on this same trip to Louisiana, here's Sarah Simmons and Bob Bateman. And Sarah lived to be 101 years old. And when she was 98, this is what she did. <laughs> this is why this lady is my role model. Because she did so much for so many different people. She's an honorary general in the US Army because she would organize people to go out to the air bases in Louisiana with hugs and cookies for the troops that are leaving and coming back and on and on. So that's my introduction. Thank you, Victor, for introducing these remarkable people to us. Well, this is not a whooping crane, it's a Eurasian crane. It's one of the most abundant cranes in the world, over half a million. But its DNA is 99.9% .9 the same as the whooping crane. It's the closest relative to the whooping crane. It has this enormous range. And every once in a while, a few come to North America. You can see them in Nebraska and in a few other places. So likely the whooping crane evolved when a, a bunch of Eurasian cranes were blown over here or moved over here when things were better with the glaciers, came into competition with the sandhill crane and evolved into a larger crane in deeper marshes. And that is our whooping crane. Can't you hear the whoop? <laughs> They're a magnificent bird. They have patches of red on top of their head. They're bare red skin and they can expand and contract instantly to tell you about their mood. They have very fancy tertials that they can raise and display. And they have what we call the butterfly threat. They'll come charging at another bird with their thighs extended, their chest pulled in, with their wings pulled back this way, and their comb expanded in both the chin and the head. And that means I'm not very happy with you. Well, the historic range was the tall grass prairie of the United States. And in the south, these prairie wetlands of Texas and Louisiana. And just this year, two pairs of whooping cranes from our newly reintroduced population in Louisiana actually nested in northeastern Texas. And the remnant flock today that comes to the Aransas Refuge breeds way up in northern Canada in a place called Wood Buffalo National Park. Well, because I started with Louisiana today, I'm going to go a, 
a bit ahead of my story and talk about the reintroduction. Now you have the Mississippi River coming down and the huge delta to the east, but the Atchafalaya River used to come and flow down to the western part of the delta, but it's been diverted, so all the water goes to the east. So we don't have the deltaic formation in the west as we used to have. And we have these huge coastal marshes, which are the light color across the southern part of the state. And we can divide the area where the whooping cranes used to be into two areas, the remaining wetlands along the coast and the former grasslands and wetlands in what we call the Cajun Prairie. This is another view of the Louisiana part of the Cajun Prairie, which actually is extended west of Houston. This was this huge place filled with Mississippi sandhill cranes, whooping cranes, Atwater's prairie chickens, and others. But most of the Cajun prairie has been converted into farmland, particularly for crayfish and for rice. John Lynch worked for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service back in the 1930s. And he observed in 1939 in May, on May 15th, the last pair of whooping cranes to breed in the non-migratory flock. Then the last bird was seen in 1951. Subsequently, there's been a great recovery of wildlife in Louisiana. The pelicans disappeared because of DDT. They're back. There are enormous colonies of white ibis each of these dots is the nest of a pair of white ibis. And the bald eagles are back. The roseate spoonbills are back. And why not the whooping cranes? This is what has happened to the Cajun prairie. There's a rotation program between flooded fields with crayfish. The next year, there'll be rice. The next year, it will be pasture. And all of those blue dots up through the Cajun Prairie are artificial water impoundments or reservoirs to create a great food basket for humans. Now the area circled by red in the lower right is a, the White Lake Conservation Area. And that's where I met Victor and Peter Matheson and Bob Bateman a few years ago, because that's the site where John Lynch saw the last pair of whooping cranes in May of 1939 with their two juveniles. That's the area where we're going to have the first releases into the White Lake Conservation Area. The yellow line outlines the border of this protected area, which is now controlled by the state. The line across the top beneath the yellow is the Intercoastal Canal. And we have a mixture of freshwater marshes and agricultural fields. Cranes like to feed in agricultural fields on earthworms and waste grain. But we have 15,000 acres of freshwater marsh, which we, would as we assumed would be today wonderful breeding habitat for these cranes. The little square is where we release the birds. We build a huge enclosure uh, with a sub-enclosure. The sub-enclosure contains birds that are produced in captivity at the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center until it closed in 2017, at least the Crane Park closed, and the Crane Foundation and several other zoos. So we bring the birds down from the captive breeding centers. We put them in this aviary for two weeks and then we release them into the wild. Each crane has color marking on one leg for individual recognition, but because the wetlands are so vast, we have to follow them by satellite. And the other leg has the satellite radio transmitter. The birds paired up, and guess what? They found so much food in the crayfish ponds that they decided this is where we're going to breed rather out into pristine wetlands along the coast. And the crayfish farmers 
have been very, very cooperative in uh, respecting and helping the cranes. <clears throat> That's a crayfish trap. A few of the cranes have learned how to put their beaks down into the trap and get a fresh <laughs> meal, but the farmers don't seem to mind. One of the problems we have, though, is hatchability. Uh, some of the embryos just die uh, during the development, and we're wondering if some of the chemicals applied to the fields are responsible. We've tested 75 different chemicals in the eggs that didn't hatch, and so, so far have not been able to find a contaminant. Here's a whooping crane settling down in her nest, and you can see the little crayfish uh, traps around her. So, uh, although we do have some mortality of the embryos, this year we had four whooping cranes fledge in the wild there in Louisiana. So, we're continuing to work on the population. It now numbers 70 birds. Most of the pairs are in crayfish fields in Louisiana, but we have the two pairs that are now coming to Texas. That's the non-migratory story. The main story tonight, of course, is the migratory cranes. And that colored area is the former breeding range of the whooping crane. That is the tall grass prairie, an area with quite a bit of rainfall to produce that ecosystem. Fires were a very important part of their story. And the surviving birds nested just a little bit north of that. So if you look at the biomes, the dark green are the taiga, the forest. The light area is the short grass prairie. And the yellow greenish area is the uh, tall grass prairie. And those are the reports of the historic nesting of the birds. Now, when the whooping crane became very rare, there were only 16 birds reported at the Aransas Refuge in 1941. But before that, there were a small number of birds came to the King Ranch. And there was a small population survived in the tall grass prairie in western Saskatchewan in a place called Looseland. And I've always wondered if the birds from Looseland were those that wintered at the King Ranch. The Canadian government is now interested in getting the whooping cranes back nesting on the tall grass prairie of Saskatchewan. And my proposal is that we raise some in Looseland, teach them to fly behind the ultralight aircraft, and bring them to the King Ranch. But I'm known for heresy, so I don't know if it will go anywhere. The Native Americans in, in many of the tribes in the Midwest revered the cranes in this case, sandhill cranes, but the crane tribe and these other tribes from northern Wisconsin joined together to create this painting, which they took to the president of the United States in 1849. And it said, we, the indigenous tribes of northern Wisconsin, are united intellectually, with the line from the head, and our hearts. We want this large area around Lake Superior to be set aside for the wildlife and for the people that depend on it in that area. And of course, it was not listened to. At the same time, the covered wagons were heading out across the prairie to their allocated locations. Can you imagine having a family in one of those wagons? There are no stores. You have your potatoes. Hopefully, you're getting out there in the spring early enough to plant potatoes to get you through the desperate winter. So a big bird was a big meal. And, the, and of course, we had all the bison and the elk and the antelope. They were all wiped out as the Europeans moved into the tall grass, fertile prairies. And along behind them came, of course, the dredgers to drain the wetlands from Chicago to the Mississippi River was one contiguous wetland full of whooping cranes and all this other wildlife. Well, the land was simply transformed. It's interesting, I work a lot in China, 
And China has about 1,600 species of birds, and they have not had one single known extinction. And look what we've lost in our country. The Carolina parakeet, because they caused a lot of crop damage, the passenger pigeons, the whooping cranes. We were pretty careless with this frontier spirit that the, the world belongs to us and we can do whatever we want to with it. In 1954, a pilot surveying for forest fires was flying over Wood Buffalo National Park. He looked down and in one of these marshes, he spotted two large white birds. He reported it to the Canadian Wildlife Service and they went back and found this little population of whooping cranes. This is 1954. By that time, there were about 28 whooping cranes in the wild. The whooping cranes nest on a platform that they build in the marsh. They lay two eggs, both the male and female assist in incubation and the rearing of the chick. The incubation period is about one month one chick hatches a day or two before the other. If there's a scarcity of food, the chicks will fight and the subordinate chick will be driven away and perishes. Consequently, the wild whooping cranes usually only rear one juvenile a year. They fledge in late summer and fly to Saskatchewan where they spend a great deal of time building up their fat reserves feeding in cornfields and wheat fields before their long migration to Aransas. This particular bird, this is the passage of one individual, the little circle indicates where it spent the night and spent some days, but in one flight, that bird flew pretty much across North and South Dakota. More recent information indicates that they take uh, flights until they get to Oklahoma and then we think they smell those blue crabs because a lot of them make a contiguous flight from Oklahoma to Aransas without stopping. From the air, maybe a little higher than whooping cranes fly, but you look down, these are the prairie potholes. And the cranes will stop overnight or maybe for a few days. They'll roost in one of these little ponds and go out into the agricultural fields. Now we have an insidious problem happening all across the central flyway. This is a wind farm. And for the past uh, eight years, we've been putting satellite radios on about 10 to 15 whooping cranes every year to follow their migration exactly where they are every day and what they're doing. And we have found that when whooping cranes are looking down like this, they will not go within five miles of the wind farm. So you see there are wetlands inside this wind farm area. So because of the wind farms, just huge areas of the central flyway are not being used by the whooping cranes. Now, whether they'll acclimate to the wind farms over time remains to be seen, but of course, if they get too close to them, that's not very good news either. Finally, they reached the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge, which its abundance of food, wolf berries, and blue crabs are the main food of the whooping crane during the winter. And they maintain very, very strict territorial boundaries. Here, two pairs meet at the edge of their perhaps 500 acre salt marsh winter territory. The, the head combs are expanded. One's pounding the ground in annoyance. They're likely unison calling at each other. And this is the charge threat of a male whooping crane. He has very, very shallow beats to his wings, very exaggerated. The red on his head is expanded. And he lands very near the other birds that he's threatening. A huge sound from the flapping of his wings into the butterfly threat display with the red expanded towards the other birds and uh, they get the message. So back in 1950, there were very few whooping cranes. The red little sections indicates the territories, uh, seven territories, a total of 31 individuals in the flock in 1950. And then uh, the 
population increased. I'm going to go through these slides very quickly. Nine territories moving out to Matagorda Island, 1971, 79, 18 territories moving up the coast, and uh, 37 territories in 1990. But you can just see how much space is required for just one pair of birds and their chicks in the winter and how important conserving huge areas of the coast is if this population is to expand. So if we look at the demographics, it's slowly increased, and you'll notice every 10 years there's a little dip in their numbers, and that dip corresponds with the crash in the rabbit population at Wood Buffalo National Park. So the wolves are likely going for young whooping cranes in years when there aren't as many rabbits. So it's very, very interesting. So in summary, from the spring migration to the fall, we have the nesting way up in the wilderness of Wood Buffalo National Park. They lay their eggs, they hatch their chicks, and the juveniles can fly after about three months. The juveniles stay with their parents during migration. They arrive at Aransas, they stay with their parents and are actually fed by their parents through the winter, and then they migrate north again in the spring. And many of you have participated in the boat trips from Rockport and Port Aransas out to see the whooping cranes at close range. This brings in about $15 million to the local communities every winter. Another huge danger, the Intercoastal Canal goes right through the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge, and should there be an accident, many of the cranes would be in harm's way. There's a festival in Port Aransas in late February every year, and you're welcome to join us. So what is the future for the whooping cranes? We know the world is warming up, and as sea level rises, many of the wetlands where the cranes are now foraging will be underwater that's too deep for them. Consequently, many conservation organizations along the coast, including the Crane Foundation, is working to conserve more inland areas so the wetlands can safely move in rather than come into some type of a development. We have the Endangered Species Act, which is very important in protecting endangered species and the ecosystems upon which they depend. Of course, on the breeding grounds, we have the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge. On the wintering grounds, the Aransas Refuge. But we have the, just this one viable population. And uh, now we have this risk from the wind farms and so on and still a lot of threats along the coast. So back in the 1960s, the US and Canadian governments worked together to collect eggs from Wood Buffalo Park to start a captive population at the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center in Maryland. And that center has been the main producer of whooping cranes for release into the wild up until the whooping crane program was closed there in 2017. This is the International Crane Foundation in Wisconsin, and this is Crane City in the foreground. We have 61 crane dominiums and 40 whooping cranes. The Patuxent flock was divided in 1989, and half of the birds came to the Crane Foundation. We keep them in netted pens. Uh, we put up visual barriers so they don't see their neighbors, and the birds are cared for very, very carefully throughout the year. Whooping cranes are very cold hardy. They don't mind the winters at all, spend most of their time outside in the sunshine and the snow, and in early spring even nest in the snow. We have little wetlands for the birds and they breed very well for us. Now, I mentioned they only lay two eggs a year in the wild, but in captivity we harvest the eggs and can get as many as six or eight eggs from one pair in a year. And if they're not fertile, we apply artificial insemination. The early eggs, we've developed a technique called costume rearing. The birds never see a normal human, they only see costume people 
with a puppet that looks very much like the hooping crane's head and neck on the right hand. Hooping crane chicks always want to stay with mom and dad for about eight or nine months, so they want to stay with the costume people. You can visit the Crane Foundation and see all 15 species of cranes in naturalistic exhibits like this one. And if you're lucky, you might see the dance of the whooping crane. They really do dance. You'll notice the female is flightless. Her flight feathers have molted out. Uh, they change their flight feathers every two or three years. And <laughs> anyway, that's what they do. <laughs> so the first experiment, so the captive population was established at Patuxent. And we really never started with the whooping cranes uh, until 1989 when the flock was divided. The first experiment to start a new flock happened out west. It happened on the breeding grounds of the Sandhill Cranes in Idaho. And they migrate to the San Luis Valley of Colorado and then on to the Rio Grande Valley of New Mexico to winter at Bosque del Apache National Wildlife Refuge. This is the Grays Lake National Wildlife Refuge in Idaho. It has a flourishing population of sandhill cranes. So whooping crane eggs were brought from Patuxent and from Wood Buffalo National Park, and they were substituted into the nests of sandhill cranes. The sandhill crane eggs were taken to Patuxent to use for research. The head research, researcher was Dr. Rod Druin, and 84 whooping cranes fledged with their foster parents. They followed them on migration. They joined the flocks of sandhill cranes. And unfortunately, they hopelessly imprinted on sandhill cranes and had absolutely no interest in pairing with their own species. So after the release of 200 and 89 eggs between 75 and 78. We had 84 birds fledged, but no pairing, and the program was discontinued. A big disappointment. But we are a resilient group. We wanted to start a new population in Louisiana, but then we debated, what if they mix up with the Aransas flock and lead them astray? So we started in Florida on the Kissimmee Prairie to, to try to establish a non-migratory flock. That was preceded by the release of captive-reared greater sandhill cranes that are migratory in this place in Florida. And they became non-migratory because they did not have the migration experience. <clears throat> so we started this program in 1993 and we released 289 birds. Most of them were produced at the Patuxent and at the Crane Foundation, and then at the Calgary Zoo, which was coming on with birds. But by 2009, only 10 chicks had survived. There was a great, the release pin, very similar to what you saw in Louisiana. And this time, the cranes were imprinted on their own species, and they formed pairs, and they developed copulation. Now, <laughs> he fell off, so he's trying again. Now, the moral of the story is don't try it on stilts. <laughs> but finally, uh, and one of the problems we have in captivity is the successful mating of the cranes, and maybe it's because they can't fly around and have the wing strength that wild cranes would have, because it does take them a while to learn. But they were breeding in Florida, but we had several insidious problems. There's so much development in Florida, with power lines especially, that in foggy conditions, the male cranes who fly out and survey their territory against intruders <laughs> 
a lot of the adult males were being killed through collision with power lines. I mentioned that cranes become flightless every two or three years. The bird on the left is flightless. A lot of the wetlands dried up providing habitat for the hooping cranes and for the alligators. And we lost a lot of birds to predation, mostly, however, from bobcats, not from, from the uh, alligators. So that experiment was discontinued because the number of birds produced in the wild was many fewer than the birds that died in the wild from, from various causes. So, we're on to experiment number three. And this is the Nisida Wildlife National Wildlife Refuge in central Wisconsin. And it became the center for the release of whooping cranes led to Florida by ultralight aircraft. The birds were hatched at Patuxent, uh, raised for about a month, and then brought out and put in these holding pens the big holding pin on the right has a lot of water, so they're trained to roost in water. Unless they're trained to do that, they may roost in dry areas and be very prone to predation. The smooth area in front is the landing strip for the ultralight aircraft. And we're very, very indebted to an operation called Operation Migration from Ontario, Canada. These are the same people that did Fly Away Home, the movie about the Canada geese that followed the ultralight. Bill Ishman and Joe Duff were the leaders in that organization. And from 2001 to 2015, they religiously came to Wisconsin, training these whooping cranes to fly behind the ultralight and then taking them on the long journey to Florida. They could only fly in the very early morning when there's not a breath of wind. If there was any wind, they couldn't fly. So these are the dots of some of the birds in 2001 to 2005. And you can see they developed the migration route. And they came back to Wisconsin to breed. They came right back to the Nasida National Wildlife Refuge. And in 2006, we had the first fledging, actually two fledged from this pair, and we thought, oh, this is golden. We're, we are going to be so successful. And they migrated with their chicks to Florida. Everything looked rosy until we discovered an insidious problem. You have all the whooping cranes nesting all over the place. Everything's looking very good. The first warm day in late April, we have this enormous hatch of black flies. And they attack the whooping cranes, much more than the trumpeter swans and the sandhill cranes. And a crane stands up, and its eggs are covered with black flies. And cranes have a brood patch of area of bare skin on their breast. They sit down, and it's just a straight target to the blood on the brood patch. And the cranes just orbit from the nest and are running around in circles trying to escape these flies, and the nests are abandoned. So we overcame that problem to some degree by moving the releases to eastern Wisconsin to Horicon National Wildlife Refuge, where there are very few black flies. And by collecting the first clutch of eggs, and by the time they recycle the black flies, numbers has been greatly reduced. And some of the pairs were then successful at the Nisida National Wildlife Refuge. And this year, it's so interesting. This year, we have about 70 birds in the Wisconsin flock and 70 birds in the Louisiana flock. And both populations fledged four chicks, the same number. But to be self-sustaining, we have to get that number up to eight to 10 chicks for that number of birds. So we're still in the dark. We haven't resolved the problems in Louisiana. And now we have the major mortality factor for the young whooping cranes in Wisconsin are coyotes. So <laughs> we continue. Story to be continued. So we have our old population, which you can see nearby. We have 
the failed population in Idaho, there are no birds left there now. We have about six birds left in the non-migratory flock in Florida, and we have 70 in each of number three and four. I've already told you the story about the resident flock in Louisiana, so I'm going to end my presentation with this beautiful video that helps you appreciate how magnificent these birds really are. And in so many cultures, the cranes are treasured because they represent longevity, devotion of the male to the female, the care lavished on their, lung, um, on their young. And all over the world, uh, we tell the story of the cranes to the local people. They can see these big birds in Africa and Asia. It's a revelation to them that this is the only place where these birds are found. And we can get a great movement for the conservation of wetlands and grasslands because the cranes are there. So they're ambassadors, they're real ambassadors uh, for their environment and also for international goodwill as we get countries to work together. The most critically endangered of all the cranes is not the whooping crane, it's its Asian cousin called the Siberian crane. They're in a completely different genus. They have a very flute-like call. Their anatomy is quite different from the other cranes. <clears throat> and they breed in northern Russia. When we started the Crane Foundation, there was a flock that migrated to Iran. Only 12 birds, but there was life, and they were breeding quite well. Another flock went to India. There were about 200 birds. But because of the political changes and warfare and governments falling apart and so on in that part of the world, shooting killed off both of these populations. And look at the, the countries that you have to work with uh, concerning the population that goes to India. We worked very hard in those countries to save those cranes, but we failed. At the same time, the Russians established a captive breeding center and they now have a flourishing flock at their center near Moscow. And they hope to repeat or to copy what we did with the whooping cranes, with the Siberian cranes. But at this point, security for human survival cannot be guaranteed in that part of the world. So our focus at the Crane Foundation in recent years has been on our eastern population. The breeding area is a huge wilderness area in Yakutia, and they winter in southern China. So we just have two countries to work with. Here are the Russians with their ultralight flying around with whooping cranes and Eurasian cranes, practicing for the day they can lead them back. And through the protection of these wetlands in China, the population has increased from about 1,000 birds to almost 5,000 birds and is continuing to increase very rapidly. But the entire population is wintering at one lake in southern China called Poyang Lake. And every time they have a new government, his big political issue is, oh, we're going to put a dam in the outflow to keep high water throughout the year in this lake, which will destroy the habitat for these migratory birds. So we continue to work on that. So that's the end of my talk tonight. I welcome you to visit the Crane Foundation. I've put a whole bunch of literature on the table and I don't want to carry it back home. <laughs> so please, please help yourself. And thanks for mentioning, Barry, that complimentary memberships. We are supported. We have about 80 on our staff now. Half of them are nationals working in Africa and Asia. We didn't have to let a single employee go during the COVID time. And uh, we have about 9,000 members. Uh, most of them are from the United States. So we welcome you to join us in, in our efforts to save this magical group of birds. The cranes, thank you. How many whooping cranes are there now? Uh, there are about 500, I think likely more, in the population that comes to Texas. And we have 70 in each of the experimental flocks. 
and we have about 150 in captivity. So total about 850 in the world. And our goal here in Texas is to get the population up over 1,000. We have four employees here now in Rockport, and uh, we're going to continue our efforts in Texas. And we'll see you here off and on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, George. What an honor to have you. And without someone like George, years from now, they might say there used to be a bird called a whooping crane. And that's a chilling thought. There are other birds like that. And I so much appreciate what George is doing in his organization. Thank you, George.